So welcome to week one. This is going to be our first chat covering the first three chapters in our textbook. And that's mainly dealing with the evolution of our communication systems. That's going to include things like our next-gen networking, VPN infrastructure, and we're going to end up with our quality of service. So course expectations. My goal here is to do video lectures on the Monday of every week in the evening, uh, normally between 6 and 8 p.m. PST. I'm also going to post these videos on YouTube. That way you have complete access to them. My goal is to be able to get them done on Monday. That way you have the rest of the week to be able to reference them. So what is this next-gen network that we keep talking about? A big part of that is uh, upgrading existing networks. For example, like an ISP might upgrade their network to stay current within the technology. Could also mean upgrading existing VPN infrastructures or a VPN style network. It can also and more generally uh, be defined as a more of a core network. This class, from my understanding, people should have already had a routing and switching class, so you guys should be familiar with a core network. Our next gen networks are actually developing a faster and higher speed and more robust core network. So before we get too far into a, a next-gen network, I want to make sure that we understand uh, things like a broadcast domain without VLANs. Within a switch, a switch by itself is going to be a broadcast domain. Each individual port on a switch is going to be a collision domain. If we hooked up the switches together, they're going to be one large broadcast domain. Broadcasts get forwarded out to a router, and the router does not pass them forward. So, what's a VLAN? A VLAN is a virtual network or a virtual, uh, virtual switch that's all residing on one physical switch. That way, Physically, it's one device, but virtually, there is two. That way, virtually, it can act as more than one switch. So what is a VPN? VPNs are virtual private networks. They're a way for us to extend our network in throughout the internet to remote locations. Here's an example of a pretty straightforward VPN connection. Here we have two locations, a branch office, a centralized site, and a home office, and all of them actually tunnel through the internet back to the central office for connectivity or access to resources. So it doesn't matter if it's a physical location or you're a mobile worker. A VPN just allows dedicated resources throughout a network. Here's our branch office, here's our centralized office, here's our home office, all flowing through the internet back to our centralized site. So how do these work? The routers or software on a laptop allow you to tunnel through an existing network to allow for end-to-end -end encrypted uh, communication. That way our branch office views as if it's part of our centralized site, even though it's going through the internet. The end devices don't realize that there's a VPN there. That's important because the next thing that we discuss is MPLS versus VPLS. MPLS is a multi-protocol label switching. It allows you to actually form a very similar type connection, except here you uh, connect to a high f uh, switching network and then the network itself has certain exits within your facility which is very similar to a VPLS except it's done off of a VPN instead of multi-protocol label switching it's just the underlying hardware 
And actually, more and more VPLSs are sitting on top of an MPLS. That way, the MPLS gives you the road connections, or the connection pathways between multiple locations, and the VPLS actually force the encryption. That way, the communication that is sent to and from is encrypted, and not just anyone can see it. And so that's actually chapter one in a nutshell. They don't really want to go too in depth with the VPLS and MPLS, so those are all dedicated services that require a lot more technical background to fully grasp. So chapter two is m more about quality of service and class of service. And that is QoS versus COS. What are they and how do they differ? So first of all, QoS, class of service, sets a particular application should get when it's doing uh, bandwidth. That is, you can set priority. Is this going to be a high priority, medium priority, low priority, a priority of five, one, two, wh whatever. The QO, or COS actually provides that priority. Uh, it's defined in the header and it's done between 0 and 7. And you would actually then assign the value between 0 and 7. That way you're guaranteed a specific performance level based off of the available bandwidth. Because you have to remember, there is no guarantee that the packet will get the performance level that they ask for. But if QoS is there and functioning, this should be given a higher priority because you assign it a higher priority. So QoS is the mechanism that tries honoring the Q, uh, COS, sorry. QoS tries to honor the priority of COS. The requests that ensure the application or traffic is getting the level of the network performance that it was assigned. That's a big thing there. That way, if it's assigned a higher priority but it can't meet it, it's going to try its best to still trying to meet it. How the QoS works is it places traffic in queues. <coughs> so how does the QoS actually work? So traffic is placed into queues. Think of little, little buckets. And there should be enough of a bandwidth or enough of a pipe underneath the buckets to allow all buckets to empty into it, thus allowing all queues to empty. The first one are the lower ones. Uh, they have to wait. The higher the priority, the, the more likely it's going to go. And they can do different ways to, to make this a little bit better, which we're going to get into those today. Next is data traffic. We have to understand kind of a few things before we can talk about QoS. Uh, data traffic is congestion control because data traffic is not symmetrical. It doesn't always get used up every day. Sometimes it'll go up, sometimes it'll go down. It just kind of depends. Congestion control is just like congestion control on the freeway. You control the flow of traffic to help prevent slowdowns. Here are a few types of traffic profiles. A represents a constant bitrate. Oh. C rec er, uh, looks at a burstable in time. So data rate will burst up, then go down. X amount of time later will burst up again, then go down. Where B is a variable bitrate. It can actually change the bitrate on the fly. So the normal question is, why are these three traffic profiles important? Because realistically, in a network, you're not going to have a ideal profile. You're going to have things where they're going to be burstable at some times. It's going to be constant at other times. Or it could be variable. Or a combination there of all three. It just kind of depends on your situation. 
But the important thing to realize is no one network consists of each of these individually or uh, or ideally. That's the important thing. So with quality of service, uh, class of service, and things like congestion, we only have so much resources. And so, for example, if we are looking at a constant bit rate, let's say the constant bit rate is 10, 10 bits per second, and we have a 15 bit pipe, you know what? That may work. But if our burstable, it bursts up to 20 bits a second, that may not work. It depends on how often we're bursting. Same thing with our variable. If our variable is going between 12 and 16, our pipe may or may not be large enough. It just kind of depends. So that's one of those topics that we kind of have to discuss. So what, <clears throat> what is our definition for congestion? Congestion in a network may occur if the load on the network... You guys can read the slide. Essentially, if the number of packets sent is greater than the capacity. So if you ever ask bandwidth, bandwidth versus throughput. Bandwidth is the maximum limit of a medium. Throughput is the actual amount of packets being sent plus the overhead. And part of that overhead uh, that has to take into account the capacity may sometimes be over the limit of the bandwidth. When that happens, congestion happens. Because what ends up happening is with the congestion mechanism, if we're expecting a constant flow of 20 megabits, and our pipe is 20 megabits. We can support that, but the second we go to 20.5 or 21 megabits, we have congestion, we have delay, because our pipe is no longer able to sustain our constant flow. So this brings up the question of, what exactly does all this mean? Like, how does the router handle all of this? So what we do is we do queues and routers. We may have an input on a, on a LAN side and maybe a interface on a WAN side and we queue what's going in, what's leaving the router. Each interface has a limited capacity and here we see the queues for each interface. The green is going to be usage and the white is going to be just excess. Here we'll see that our bandwidth or our capacity for this line is a hundred percent. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bars. Five are uh, dedicated for input, three are dedicated for output, and those are what are currently being used. That doesn't mean that the router cannot process more, it just means that right now these interfaces could be maxed. So what are some flow characteristics? Because these are this is all dealing with flow into and out of the router. When we bring up the word flow characteristics, we're talking things like reliability, delay, uh, wait time because of congestion, jitter. How is the, uh, the actual signal being affected or manipulated because of noise, that'd be jitter. And bandwidth, slash throughput, slash capacity. Those are all characteristics for flow. That's important because when we start talking in terms of the actual flow of packets, we have to understand well what all consists of flow. Reliability, see that's one thing we didn't bring up. So uh, going back to our 20 meg pipe, if we have 20 megs of traffic, again, also assuming that includes overhead, what happens if there is some reliability issues and we're having to resend several bits? Then that just jacks up how much uh, of our pipe we're using. If we're already at capacity, we are going to be running out. 
there will be congestion because of the reliability going uh, down. So, let's talk about motivation. The motivation for most next-gen networks is best effort service. That means all packets are treated the same. However, we can actually manipulate that so that it's not best effort. But should we? Not all packets are the same. Sometimes HTTP could be a delay sensitive. Voice and video streaming, those are delay and jitter sensitive. Online gaming, delay sensitive, jitter sensitive. So if we're treating all packets the same, these are all things that are sensitive. HTTP, okay, we can argue that one, but voice and video streaming, those are heavily reliant on faster than uh, normal delivery. Best effort, that means they will not do acknowledgements for these guys. So that will probably be UDP, not TCP, because UDP is connectionless oriented, where TCP is connection oriented. Connection oriented being it guarantees delivery. Connection lists best effort. That way, if you're doing in the middle of a voice conversation and you drop three packets, you don't have to wait for those three packets to be resent. It just drops them and it ignores them. So it just kind of depends on what areas we're talking about. Lastly is our BitTorrent. Totally insensitive. It doesn't really matter. So, how should we implement quality of service with these services? Maybe quality of service so that video, voice, and online gaming are highest priority. And HTTP may be next. BitTorrent, there is no quality of service. It gets there when it gets there. One of the hard things when we talk about this is it's just going to depend on your organization. Because every organization is different. So that's something you have to keep in mind. So what are some relevant factors? There are normally three major relevant factors. Application for por uh, performance. Because we are talking about networks, that's going to be a communication flow. The communication that's flowing through the network, how much bandwidth is going to be needed for key critical applications on that network. Uh, do we have to worry about delay or jitter? Is uh, latency an issue? For example, VoIP. VoIP delay and jitter does cause issues where maybe a, a database qu uh, query may take an extra second or two, and that's okay. It just kind of depends on your organization. Not saying that database could take an extra second or two, I'm just saying within your organization, you're probably going to have to look at specific criteria to see how it's relevant within that situation. Because not all situations are going to be the same. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, bandwidth required to, uh, to provide the performance. Not how much bandwidth is needed, but how much it will be needed to meet your goal. Are we still able to offer other services with that? So if our application needs 15 megabits and our network is 20 megabits, that only leaves us 5 megabits of transfer speed above that. That may or may not meet our performance goal. We may want 50% above our usage. So if we're using 15, we may want 23 megabits. Again, it's just going to be dependent on your organization. Next is complexity and cost requirements of the mechanisms. How do you have to modify the network to meet your performance goals? Are there any political concerns, network neutrality, uh, interdepartment communications that will affect this? Because if we are trying to implement some form of quality of service, normally does uh, the current infrastructure support quality of service? 
does the current hardware support it? If it doesn't, if we're going to purchase it, are we going to have any organizational political concerns? People forget about political concerns when it comes to organizations because they are out there and sometimes it's... Yeah, it, it's not always easy to get around political situations within an organization. Even when it's for the best for the organization. Okay, moving on to back to quality of service. The idea should be to build some unfairness into the network. What I mean by that is some traffic is going to have higher priority, or gets better service. Or, some traffic needs to get lower priority to get reduced service. That way, we are not treating everything equally. If you don't have implement quality of service, normally all traffic is created equally. But again, things like voice, video, those are all high priority services that probably should get dedicated priority or higher priority than everything else. Because if it takes an extra half second for your page to load on the internet, big deal. If it takes an extra half a second for your voice a conversation to get there, that may be a big deal. If you ever see the ads where you have two people talking on the phone and they're at different parts in the conversation, that's one of the key indicators for why VoIP is important, why VoIP uh, with QoS is also important. Thus, important traffic should receive better service. But then, what do you mean by better traffic? What do you mean by important traffic? Your organization is have to guarantee and strictly define better and important. Big thing here is your organization is going to have to do it. Every organization is going to be different. So our outline. I can every time I've tried fixing this site it never really works. So we have two types of quality of service. Software and hardware. So the software portion is packet shaping or prioritization or diff serve. Hardware QoS is int serve. I know most people probably won't understand diff serve and int serve, but that's what we're going to be going over. So what exactly does all of this mean? So here's a, a, a problem with sharing or, uh, resources between two applications, web traffic and a torrent. What ends up happening is the router has a finite packet queue. What I mean by that is it's not infinite, it's not unlimited. It has a very specific packet size. Let's say that our packet queue is 5. And so what will happen is, when we get 5 pieces of information, we will send our packet. And so what we could do is, it may be filled up by just uTorrent, or a torrent program. What happens if there's an additional six uh, packets stuck in there? If our packet queue is five, it should send after five bits. If the packet size is six, then it may send after the six packet. The problem then becomes is, well, this is all one type of traffic. By adding in the one additional bit for the web traffic, that may be a bad thing. So, we can actually just drop it. That way, what we could do is send just the 5 for our uTorrent and have the additional bit from our web enter th to a next packet queue. So here we talk about large, long-lived flows that can be uh, dominating the queues. Elephant versus mice. Torrent programs are probably going to transfer way more data than web traffic. So, instead of going back with a one packet queue, we could actually do port based quality of service, and that is going to be two queues, one with a higher priority, one with a lower priority. That way, the higher priority 
it will have again probably five bits but this one will be sent with priority that way again our torrent program doesn't fall into those common ports and so it's sent in the lower queue our web traffic is sent to our higher queue what ends up happening is we can actually send our higher priority queue out first before we send out our lower priority what we'd normally set is how full they have to be before we send them out or if there's a time so every half a second or every millisecond even if this is not full we'll send this out regardless that way we're not waiting for this to fill and in between uh, each bit we just kinda wait where this one may fill quicker we may actually be sending this one out because again this one has a higher priority so here we could also do a one-to-one -one where it sends one bit from each one with the higher priority coming off the top so quality of service on a larger scale what about it across the internet so right now we're only talking about quality of service up to the edge of our network because again we don't control our ISP so it's kind of hard to have quality of service throughout remember MPLS and uh, VPLS those we can actually provide quality of service end to end because we're paying for dedicated points throughout their uh, throughout an ISP's network so between the endpoints in MPLS or VPLS we can do that so large scale of research in the 90s differentiated services that's our diff service it's class-based traffic management allowing for better uh, finite controller uh, very narrow controls for improved performance and a pretty low overhead so realistically what ended up happening is we got a lot better control but that's all software integrated service int serve that's going to be flow based traffic management mechanism for fine grained control so it's the difference between coarse grain and fine grain how narrow of a scope do we want to be able to organize it and again diff serve is software int serve is hardware they are slightly different so we do have to keep that in mind so quality of service continues with actually going deeper into the diff serve and int serve we go pretty in depth with our quality of service if you've ever picked up a quality of service text Oof, in depth. A lot of people don't understand the major differences within quality of service. I actually, I just took a certification a little while ago to get certified with my Cisco uh, QoS, and it was it was intense. So the diff serve. The major thing here is it offers different levels of service to individual packets. It's or uh, organized around autonomous system numbers, and it normally involves the end or the edge points. Uh, our edge routers set different bits, a DSCP in the header, DSCP in the packet header. That way, it can help with traffic shaping uh, it normally happens on edge and core routers so what exactly does that mean here we go between uh, the 8th byte and the 16th byte we have our DSCP that is dealing with our quality of service that's the way we can label it remember when we talked about MPLS about labeling items this is one way to label them 
So here we have two separate autonomous system numbers. We are on one side, we're accessing resource on another side. We have our one router, which is our ingress egress route. We have core routers in the center. And we go from there. So our packet comes into our core, our ingress point. The router assigns a class to each packet. Sadly, it must analyze each packet, so it does have higher overhead, but we assign it a specific label. Then it's allowed to go to each of the cores with uh, a more higher priority, or lower priority, an assigned priority. Then between the two AS numbers, the core router uses that class to do priority queuing. To send it to the edges, it does priority queuing. When it gets to the edge between two AS numbers, it will do the same thing. The edge routers can do class switching, so that means that both these routers can know the priority, and this AS number AS2 can elect to keep the same priority number of the packet. That way, throughout AS2, the packet has the same priority. So yes, it does have some higher overhead, but this will allow us end-to-end -end connectivity with uh, the same priority uh, prioritization. That way, end-to-end, -end, we can have the same priority. Again, classes may switch between boundaries, but they don't necessarily have to. So what about individual per hop? How does that come into effect? Because the before we were looking at a AS numbers separate, uh, but what about indi uh, individual between each route? we can actually set uh, different items there. So we can do a best effort between routers. We could do explicit forwarding. Again, these are all going to be per hop uh, behavior, PHB, per hop behavior. Or we can do a more uh, uh, assured forwarding uh, volume. Again, it's just, this is a different way of doing QoS based on the IP header there's just so many different ways so it just kind of depends on the situation so how do we classify packets it, it really just depends we could do it based off of ports we can set up lists so that some ports take or some uh, applications take higher priority than others we c uh, sorry ports than applications or hey maybe even locations we could say that uh, hospitals take higher priority because they come from a higher priority uh, listed uh, or stamped uh, organization. Or we could also do uh, who pays for a premium. If you pay for cable, you may have uh, the option to pay more for faster speeds. Sometimes it's faster speeds, sometimes it's for a higher priority on the queue list. It just kind of depends. These are all different ways for traffic policies and shaping. Those are just some of the methods. So what is the definition for our traffic policy or shaping? And that's a need for a mechanism to control the flow. How are we sending our data? Uh, we can actually classify it high, medium, low, extra high, low high, it just kind of depends. So, think of it kind of more as a toll booth. We have a toll bucket. We have two items within our toll bucket. The rate that the bucket will fill, and the size of the tokens in the bucket. The bucket's only so large, and so we can actually uh, do this by increasing either R or B. If we increase the rate that the bucket fills, the bucket will be emptied sooner. That would be the egress uh, for our packet queue. 
or we can actually increase the size of the tokens so it takes fewer tokens to send. If a token is available, packets may pass, otherwise packets may be queued or dropped. So what exactly does that mean? Okay, so some of these, they're not the easiest to understand, so I'm going to do my best to explain them. So we have one method called the leaky bucket method, and we have the speed r that will go into a queue, that's the size of the, the coin, and then it will actually drop into a packet queue. And then once the packet queue is sent, it'll be the packet queue that gets filled, it'll actually be sent down our connection. Here we use big or capital R, because that's the maximum link capacity. So we'll set a packet queue maybe to five bits. And here we have we will get a bit per millisecond. And the bucket will actually be getting a bit per second. So it may take a few seconds for us to get enough uh, information to actually fill our queue, be able to send it out. It just kind of, again, depends. Other things could be uh, speed packets. Uh, if we're doing a fast uh, speed, we may not have to wait for a specific size. It's just we send it as they come, or we could do a slower one. Again, this kind of depending. Or what about burst tolerance? We may actually have to be able to say that the queue is going to take a large packet. Or, hey, every five bits we'll send it out. Assuming this is going to be five bits. Here it could be 15 bits. It kind of depends on our queue size. If on the bottom diagram, Let's say these queues are 10 bits, and one block is equal to 5 bits. Our burst, this might be a small block, we may get two uh, small block bursts before we're allowed to send out that packet. Where here, we may have to do two for the large, and then wait for another large burst before to send it out. Again, we could probably classify these two ways. So if the packet is uh, full, or after X amount of time, that way we can guarantee that the packet will be sent. And here's our example. As we get a packet in, it will send it out. Here's a little bit slower. Now our burst, our burst is going to be a lot slower. where our larger bursts could be a little faster. Again, it just kind of depends on your organization. So what are some of the advantages of our diff serve? Again, this is our software. Given priority doesn't improve performance, meaning it at the expense of reducing performance for lower classes. So, everyone is going to get the same speed, but when you give a higher priority, it does not affect the performance for the lower ones. It's lightweight. It's pretty easy to deploy. Once you actually get in there, most of this, you're like we are going way more in depth with our quality of service than we have to. Just that way, so we have a basic understanding of how in depth our QoS really gets. So, what are some disadvantages of our diff serve? Disadvantages, no performance guarantees, all gains are relative, not absolute, classes are very uh, coarse. What happens if the AS numbers don't support it? What happens about security? Because with security, any host can tag traffic as high priority. Examples, Windows 2000 tagged all traffic as high priority by default even if we didn't want it to. So, don't know why this slide is still in here, but we've talked about our software QoS. Now let's get more into our hardware QoS. 
So a big part of this we have to talk about is our service level agreements, relative versus absolute service. How do we actually guarantee delivery? So we can do a priority mechanism that is delivered on absolute assurance. We are going to guarantee X amount of service regardless. We can actually set up service level agreements that specify our speed. Our diff service may offer unspecified delay and no drops. Normally our SLAs here are managed by a bandwidth broker. That again, that's just saying, hey, we are going to be working to get, provide X amount of service, no drops, but there may be some delay. And then within that agreement, you'd work out how long of a delay is okay. Uh, goals of our int service, end-to-end -end guarantees. It provides reservations so that you get the speed that you're paying for. I know there's some bleed over here. There's nothing I could do about that. The diagram just would not work. So here we can actually reserve a specific speed. But does that mean all the way through it will provide it? That's the question. If your network allows for reservations, then you must uh, perform admissions control. That's going to be one of the big e uh, items here. Part of this is flow control. What flow or what portions should be admitted? Should we prioritize everything? When we're doing this, this is talking more about our int service. So for high level int service design, again, we're talking end to end hardware QoS. And that's so that applications can run on lower end hosts and we can guarantee a, at least a certain level of performance. We can guarantee end to end on a per flow basis per application. We can guarantee certain states in the router to constantly update themselves and to have, again, a solid QoS plan through and through. Though, an interesting fact is our int service is multicast oriented, so that's a single to many uh, connection. So it does provide things like better uh, fixed stable paths, better uh, maintenance, better state for reserved bandwidth, and that could also include some security. So that's actually it for this week. I hope you guys had a nice view of our quality of service and how in-depth they truly get. So for the most part, we talked about quality of service, next generation networking, uh, upgrading existing ISPs networks in forms of QoS, network performance, and again, uh, in terms of QoS. We started talking about existing infrastructure within VPNs, but we didn't go really in depth with it. But that would be our VPLS and MPLS or our VPNs over MPLS. The key thing here is pay attention to our VPN technology because that's growing in popularity faster than most other items. Quality of service is important, next gen networking is important, and so is our VPN infrastructure. I want to thank you guys and hope you guys have a great Okay, so I wanted to discuss some follow-up items. One of the first things is our APA formatting and citation. That goes for both our IPs and our discussions. Remember that we have to do all of our work according to APA manual. So if you're not sure how to do that, go online. Uh, you can type in APA formatting. 
uh, if you don't want to look it up online you can go to any of the tutorial services we have a writing we have a library service they can give you additional resources on how to do APA formatting that's important that's not going away uh, in discussions same thing we have to be doing our citations in our discussions because one of the big things is for our citations we're building off of other people's works so it's a way for us to verify what we're claiming is supported by the literature so when I say something at the sky is blue you can take my word for it or if I provide a citation you can take an expert's word for it and then I built off of that so it just kind of increases your credibility we should be at least citing in every uh, post or as much as possible because again we're trying to link what we've done back to the literature same thing in our IPs every paragraph should be uh, tied to a source every paragraph is an idea and every idea we need to have support within the literature and I know at this level it's not that big of an issue but you want to get in the habit of doing that so when you start doing higher level work it's second nature also length we don't need posts that are great job I mean don't get me wrong it does add to it but when I start grading for posts I'm not doing uh, full credit for those that have three posts and two of them are great jobs I don't count the great jobs as a post for our discussion board I'm looking for three solid responses with citations uh, for our papers I'm looking for three pages of content with citations so what I mean by content is that's three papers on topic that's not a cover page that's not your reference page that's three content pages uh, two if you're really good but I'm really looking for three if you're doing uh, diagrams diagrams totally are okay as long as you're doing them within APA formatting lastly grading again I grade off of heavily off of attempt like if you're putting an effort into it like if you did two pages and you did a few citations and I could see that you were making an effort I'll, I'll meet you but if you post once or you did a page and a half with one citation you know that really isn't you making an effort uh, if you get stuck don't get me wrong some people a page is a lot if you get stuck you have plenty of resources to bolster up your paper you can contact me I'll help you if you don't want to contact me we have a writing uh, center we have a tutorial uh, tutorial center we have plenty of help for you to get if you need tutoring there's a lot of tutoring out there and uh, again provided from the school all you have to do is say something for our tutorial lab we have tutor uh, tutorial services for SQL we have tutorial services for database we have tutorial services for math English writing research library services I mean we have a great amount of tutorial services and if we don't offer tutoring in a specific area you can ask for it specifically and they will find tutors for you so you cannot use you cannot get tutoring cuz you can if you ask for help the school will get it if you cannot get it from the school there's other help I will sit down with you I will do as much as as much as I can with you if you need one-on-one -on -one. if you need tutoring and you don't get tutoring that's not a failure on my part that's not a failure on the school's part that's only a failure on your part because there's plenty of opportunities there you have my number you have my email you have two emails from me you have my cell phone number you have plenty of ways to get a hold of me if you need help and again if you don't capitalize on help and you need help that's on you that's on you 
Okay, there's plenty of help out there. All you have to do is say something. Thank you.